Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third event of Paraspar's Understanding India series. Today we have Dr. Kastav Deka to present before us a political uh, historical account of uh, India's Northeast. Uh, Dr. Deka is a very um, bright scholar from the region, and we have a, uh, it's a pleasure to have him here today uh, to give you a brief introduction of Dr. Kastav Deka. He teaches at the Department of Political Science, Divrugar University, Assam. Formerly, he was with the Center for Northeast Studies and Policy Research, Jamia Mila Islamia, New Delhi. He has been a fellow at the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy, Chennai, where he looked into the issue of youth and political participation in the context of India's Northeast. He holds a doctorate degree from the School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. His academic interest includes, besides others, issues of uh, ecological politics in Northeast India, trends of youth politics and identity, assertions in the region, as well as inquiries into understanding the category of Northeast India. We welcome you, Kostov. Thank you, Vidasta. Pleasure to be here. All right, so uh, thank you, Vidasta, and thanks uh, to Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, for this really wonderful platform. And I will today attempt to actually talk on a very broad theme. I mean, I'm aware of that it is uh, kind of, you know, open-ended also, and uh, it will try, I will try to cover quite various aspects of Northeast into that. And uh, it will be more like a conversation where I will be showing uh, you a couple of slides, few photographs of my travel into different parts of Northeast India. And we, through them, trying to make some sense of this uh, unfolding of uh, the category that we call as Northeast India into a certain direction. I will try to bring into uh, some discourse of development, security, resource extraction, etc. And we will see in the course of the lecture, we will see that uh, what are the difficulties one has while one talks of this thing, what are the difficulties that one has. And uh, if some of you have gone through the abstract already, you will see that uh, I actually try to begin the whole uh, lecture or this short uh, disposition uh, based on my interaction or you can say rather my encounter with one very interesting uh, fellow. And uh, the, on the screen that you see, the waterfall that I'm talking about actually is the one on the screen. Uh, and the title, as we know, it's about what does an old man sitting by an ancient waterfall tell us? India's Northeast is an ecological plot made of extractions, exuberance and expectations. So, um, well, uh, while trying to come up with this uh, lecture, while I received the email from Vitasta some days back, I was trying to think, I was trying to figure out what would be a good way to approach this very broad and, you know, in internally kind of differentiated type of a uh, topic, which is India's Northeast. Uh, I thought maybe why not start with a particular kind of story. And from that story, then we can branch out to the different interesting, uh, at times contradictory, and fascinating facets of India's Northeast. So moving on. That waterfall that we previously saw uh, was called Sikodida Waterfall. That's in um, Shiomi district of Arunachal Pradesh, which is in fact a newly created district. Earlier it was part of West Yang district. And it is one of the bordering district of India. McMohan line is very, very near to that district. I will show you the map very soon. And uh, this person on the screen, uh, his real name, he was not willing to share with the larger audience, but I am trying to give him his community name. He's from the Adi tribe, uh, who is a transnational tribe who lives uh, mostly in Arunachal, even beyond the border in Tibet, uh, 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 which is autonomous region of China. So uh, uh, let's call him Mr. Tago. So, uh, I met uh, Mr. Tago, he was sitting by the waterfall, you know, warming himself with this fire and we started talking. And, uh, you know, I have this habit of when we go to remote places of Northeast, uh, it's always interesting to talk and getting to know different facets, uh, their life histories, the lived histories. So uh, he, in fact, very casually remarked that, you know, he has been, uh, that, that he's from that area and he has seen the highway change course many times. His village has changed along with the highway, his village kept, which is called Basti in the local language. His Basti kept changing, you know, uh, many times. And in fact, on the left in the screen, if you see, this is a uh, sign by BRO, which I find very interesting in this context. It says, if I can zoom in, it says, we cut mountains to connect hearts, which 
is very, very relevant and in fact ironical in this context. Uh, and uh, Mr. Tago's uh, uh, village, in fact, was above the waterfall, the waterfall that we just saw, Sikodi, the waterfall, which for many is just uh, another tourist attraction uh, for people who pass by, click pictures, stop by the waterfall, because now it falls on a very strategic, crucial highway. Um, but he said his village was on the top of the waterfall, a couple of kilometers trek from the waterfall, and where apparently there is another bigger waterfall, the real waterfall, which is there. And he was then sharing me the story of 1962 Chinese incursion into India and how he was at, at his prime of his youth at that time and how he basically had to say he and a couple of his friends, they acted as volunteers, as scouts, and there were troops of Indian army who was lost into the jungle and they kind of rescued them, showed them the right way and went all the way with them to the plains of Assam. So, and, uh, so that fascinating history. And what immediately kind of came into my mind was that, you know, we basically hear the, for those of us who are interested in this history of these parts, uh, India, Indochina conflict of 1962, India-China conflict of 1962 is known mostly uh, for the Sela or Tawang sector or Walong or, you know, this Kibitu sector, these two borders. But this Siang sector was not so well known. In fact, it is often hardly, one hardly hears of Siang sector. So what interestingly, uh, I started looking more into the, his story and to my great surprise and uh, delight, I found that in fact, the very story that he was recalling that has been also recorded by some of the military personnel. And in fact, it is called the unknown battles. And in fact, if you, if you can read in the screen, in fact, this one that he says that many died of exhaustion, including the commanding officer. Uh, and he says that there was, in a way, the hunting, hunter's track to Tato, where officers got lost. In fact, this Tato is the location where this waterfall is there. So, in fact, that is the village of uh, Mr. Tago. So, therefore, I, could, I was able to place his testimony into the war archive also a lesser known archive. And this is the present Mechuka town, which I had visited some time back. And in fact, beyond those mountains somewhere is the McMohan line. It's almost another only 15 kilometers. As you can see, it has fallen into the Chinese hands in uh, 1962 for a few days. And uh, this is the map of uh, the Siko with the waterfall. You can see I have put an arrow here. Uh, Ningxi, which is uh, one of the headquarters of the Linxi province of Tibet. You can see it's almost across the other side of the mountains. Uh, and this is that waterfall where I was showing you Mr. Tago's waterfall. And this is the Brugger where I'm based, where I'm speaking from right now. So you can see this is the larger kind of geopolitical theater, you can see. And this has a uh, lot of implication about how Northeast as a category, as a region is envisioned. And starting from uh, his story, uh, this small snippet of, uh, what, of an old man sitting by the waterfall, seeing history unfold, partaking in the history, being forgotten by the history, being not known by the history, in fact, is a larger reflection on the way uh, Northeast as a category has been unfolding, Northeast as a category has been approached and appropriated. So starting from his uh, story and the resilience of the waterfall, and now why I call it resilience, and now this will be my maybe further, I mean, it's ongoing research that because I've also come across accounts from him and other people from the village that uh, during the period of a few months where the Chinese were stationed in and around that place before they militarily withdrew and there was a ceasefire against or, or cessation of hostility and Chinese kind of pulled back, they were stationed in his very village and the waterfall was in a way harnessed into a reservoir. And uh, people claim that there are still traces of some, you know, activities and machineries you can see. And there were also attempts to harness some kind of, you know, small level, maybe some hydroelectric kind of, you know, project. So that gives us a very interesting, you know, insight into this whole presence of water, water as resource, something that empires are fighting for. So from a small story of a person in a small 
of, of you can almost say oblivious kind of you know a place of oblivion you can actually trace back so much of geopolitics which is in a way you can say reflective of the larger region so i just take this as a cue to go into the larger debate uh, now quickly giving the larger backdrop because these are very complex or very broad uh, topics and perhaps in discussion we will have time to come back to some of them uh, if you see india's northeast experience which is called india's northeast experience it's unfolding in many ways there are three however there are three important points why this is important why northeast is important despite being uh, a landmass of only less than 8% of the country or a population size of less than 4% of the country but why it assumes so much significance of course number one is the geopolitical location it's the tri junction of south east and southeast asia the ecological resources that it's you know very rich in terms of biodiversity as well as other flora and fauna it is of course also the diversity of culture extremely extremely diverse and rich um, cultural minorities having own unique uh, cultural profile so these are the three kind of triadic point of importance but if you see uh, a lot of literature that has emerged i'm talking about social science literature uh, there are three vantage points from which the issue of northeast have been approached with one that is the idea of security and we already saw a glimpse of it in terms of geopolitics and geosecurity there is the idea of security that it is a very vulnerable spot when it comes to the issue of security both uh, you can say international as well as internal security then the idea of development that it is seen as a development deficit region that it's seen that there are on many markers it is lagging behind so there are a lot of you know intervention that is that is through the developmental kind of framework and equally important is the idea of that it has been seen as a place where there is a lack of you know uh, information there is a gap when it comes to the information of the culture of the place so there is a element of cultural obscurity that often kind of you know shrouds any kind of discussion or position or approach on northeast so security development and cultural obscurity three three vantage points there are three kind of forces that are at play that as a whole produces india's northeast experience now i know that i am clubbing too many things at one go because i want to move on to the main discussion and these points are of course a lot of contestations into a lot of debates maybe we can come back to that at some point and before i move on also one more thing that needs to be clear is that uh, this whole idea about you know uh, northeast being uh, the when we use the category northeast india we essentially wipe out lot of internal diversity that is there in the region that is already as a given we are using it more as a at this point you are using it more as a normative or a conceptual category or even as a strategic category being aware of the internal diversities that are there and there are different scholars who have approached this uh, uh, william van chandel calls northeast a freak child of partition that is you know uh, uh, northeast india basically uh, is a fallout of colonial residual policies so we'll come back to that later the whole idea about that freak child of partition but what is important at this point to remember is that that northeast and especially assam has also some specific some specific geographical or ecological connotations also that flood and uh, displacement is much higher land erosion is much higher than the natural natural average forest erosion is also much higher these things have to be kept in mind when we discuss the subsequent points so because of that uh, because of this ecological kind of extremities and we see this three kind of ideas about security development and obscurity it has become a land of binaries but at the same time intimate binaries that is there are a lot of kind of lived interaction between the categories often what we come across in the different readings that migrant versus native vis-a-vis -vis settler vis-a-vis -vis indigenous citizen vis-a-vis -vis foreigner insider vis-a-vis -vis outsider i'm just setting out the larger context before we you know move into the uh, three different ways extraction exuberations and expectation how northeast is understood uh, i'm just quickly sharing with you some of the literature that is interesting literature that is coming up on the northeast one of course as we are aware of james scott's idea of zomia or anarchist history of upland southeast asia has been applied a lot in the case of northeast 
there is this idea of how many communities are evading the state, they are upland communities. Then there is a very powerful idea of ecological and social which I will come back to in a very central way. And there is idea about post-territorial geography of networks and flows. Sometimes it is called a difficult geography. Uh, people like, again, uh, Menadi Van Der Schien, Minakshi Borgotevi, B.G. Carlson, they have written a lot on it. And finally, also, Northeast as a place of friendship and relationship is another unique way of understanding that it is a place where there are a lot of dependence, mutual dependence, which reflects the geog geographical or ecological category also. Valley and plain, river and forest. So this kind of equation of interdependence. So this needs to be understood. But finally, in my talk, what I'll emphasize today is that I want to emphasize on an unfolding ecological plot. And I think this is very important that this, after we hear about so many different type of, you know, understanding of Northeast, mostly through the security point of view or developmental point of view, we have to now really talk about the ecological plot of Northeast, how it is actually more than anything. Crucially, there is the unfolding plot, which is based on the ecology of existence. Now, here again, we find uh, the idea of ecological nationalism very interesting and useful for us, where the whole idea about ecology or one's references to ref natural is nature is considered critical to one's self understanding about nationality and uh, you know nation and as i mentioned before bg carlson's idea that how this inability to inability of people to connect with one's resource to control and engage with one's resource is in a way critically influencing the whole becoming of the reason into a resource frontier so these ideas throughout my talk will kind of you know, keep coming back. So I want everyone to just keep that in the back of mind. I'll come back to this point again. So now let's talk about uh, extraction. Now this picture on the screen uh, that you see, uh, I think in one photo it illustrates the whole history of you know unfolding of the empire from colony to post colony. The the garden you see here is actually a uh, uh, Tea Garden, which is one of the oldest in the region. This is from uh, Upper Assam, near a place called Makum in Tinsukia district, not far from where I'm based actually. Uh, this is called Bisapupi Tea Garden, which is established in 1851. So by some record, it is apparently the um, third tea estate of the whole of India. So uh, the Bisapupi name, in fact, is again very interesting because it is named after the chief of the Chimfo community which is called Zinfo in Myanmar, another transnational community, uh, uh, who are credited with the quote-unquote discovery of tea, because they are the ones who taught uh, the British captain, uh, Bruce, uh, about the art of tea making, commercial tea plantation. So this garden is named after the Bisa Gam, who is the name of the chief, it is called Bisa Kupi. Uh, and in this oldest tea garden, you see there's a railway line cutting through, and they, both sides there are garden, tea estate. And this railway line is, in fact, the oldest in the north, whole of Northeast and one of the oldest in India. Again, if I'm right, the third railway track in 1890. And that was laid basically to transport tea as well as coal because the coal belt of Margarita Lidu, which is not far from here. So in one photo, actually, you see the mechanisms of a resource empire or a frontier where things are being extracted and being, you know, I pulled out from. What makes it interesting that nothing much has changed in this photo. But also, although this line was used to be a narrow gauge line, now it's become you know, broader, broad gauge. Otherwise, you know, this uh, the mechanisms of the empire is very much visible in this one photograph. Um, so, which uh, I interestingly, I took this photograph again standing on one of the recently constructed uh, extension of highway. So new kind of, you know, this how these arterial highways are more and more expanding and there are new points to capture this. So this issue of road will come back again in my discussion, how this expansion of roads are very interesting. So moving on, from very near from this spot now, interestingly, this incident happened. Uh, now some of you must have heard of this uh, uh, Bajan gas uh, blowout that happened almost around this time, in fact, last year. Um, and it was, uh, it became pretty talked about because it was not uh, easy to contain the fire. It was a massive fire. In fact, uh, this was taken from 
uh, almost a distance of uh, five to six kilometer from the other side of the river. This is river is called Dibru River. Uh, and you could actually hear a very loud humming noise all the way from here. And uh, this was, uh, this in fact created a lot of devastation. A lot of houses had to be evacuated. There were a lot of loss of, you know, livestock and poultry. There were uh, a lot of paddy fields got, you know, irreparably damaged. And most importantly, loss of precious biodiversity because this area in fact happens to be a very uh, important wetland. And in fact, in this river, uh, the Blue River is also a habitat of endangered river dolphins, aquatic river or aquatic dolphins. So uh, you know, there were cases, documented cases of river dolphins being dead, you know, floating in the river, endangered turtles being dead, a lot of loss of, you know, uh, this wetland was also a place for migratory birds. So there are a lot of this kind of very, you know, uh, sensitive kind of uh, ecology or the ecosystem that got affected by this kind of gas blowout. Now, what is interesting is that uh, this gas blowout cannot be understood just as a dis industrial disaster. And, uh, and that's what connects this slide to the former slide. Because, you know, there are, um, of course, there are already a lot of discussions and interesting work on the existence of oil in a certain place, what it does to the place, the complex coexistence of minerals like tea, oil, to a landscape, to a militarized landscape. So we'll come to that. Uh, and, and you can see that these two photos again, that this disaster has to be understood in a backdrop of a complex political ecology. Because, you know, this uh, slide that you see on the right was very near to the place where I saw the previous slide from the photo and the river. If you come out from the place that is called Guizan, uh, uh, you see this very randomly on the roadside, you see this uh, kind of memorial plaque. And it talks about a person who was killed by police. And in fact, the whole area that way is dotted with these memorials. And therefore, you have to remember that this, uh, this incidents, this industrial disaster, so-called industrial disasters, are also unfolding in a very militarized landscape. And that is one. On the second slide, you see that that is actually a picture by... Uh, uh, a uh, person called Diplop, Diplop Sutia. I did not actually that got hidden. I had written the courtesy. It's called Diplop Sutia who shared this picture as a local resident there. Uh, he's an activist, environmental activist. Um, in fact, you know, this uh, to understand this picture again, we'll have to, in a way, go a little into the cosmology of the place. What is the cosmology of the place? What is the indigenous practices of the place? Now, these areas, this is from a village called Barakuri village. And it is inhabited by an uh, ethnic community called the Moran community, who's, who are an uh, indigenous community of the place, indigenous ethnic community of the particular place. And out of the many traditional uh, uh, significance, uh, traditional cultural practice they have, one is that they keep some of the one specific primate called Holok Gibbon, who is in the ape group, a primate. Uh, who is again endemic uh, primate endangered and specific to certain places. They are considered almost extension of their village, part of their family. So every household will have, you know, in their trees, they have this small kind of a wood, wood forested, wood, woodland kind of a feature of the houses. So they have these primates who are living there and looked after by the village as part of their own. And in the Bagjan, um, uh, this blow out when temperature abnormally rose and there are a lot of poisonous fume in the air. There are allegations of these primates. In fact, in the picture, you can see a pregnant uh, Holok Gibbon who passes out. And uh, you can see there is a post-mortem going on. So there are these allegations of, you know, these frustrations of people not being able to, you know, uh, continue with the traditional practice and having this kind of, you know, uh, uh, situation beyond and besides their immediate problems of livelihood and uh, paddy fields being lost, etc. So this various multiple implications of uh, industrial disaster. Whereas at the same time, we'll also have to remember one more thing, uh, without which this whole understanding will not be complete. And that will take us to the next slide. That is that even in a place like Bhagjan, uh, what is emerging now slowly, and this goes with this uh, understanding is actually uh, same in other places of you no know, ecological kind of you no know, 
assertion that it follows the trajectory of demands of compensation and perhaps rehabilitation. So these are the two pronged approach everywhere it's prescribed. And here what we are seeing is that uh, Bhagjan, there is this intense kind of politic politicization of the compensation round. There are people who are now alleging there are middlemen who are coming in. In fact, now people are getting to know that, you know, there are my limited field work in the area. I mean, I'm getting to hear that uh, there are even claims that, you know, people want higher compensation. And because of that, people want uh, some kind of industrial presence in their places so that, you know, one is eligible for compensation. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that it is difficult to understand this type of unfolding of the ecological plot in very linear in kind of simplistic terms, but you have to complicate. There is, you know, participation, collaboration, as well as resistance and complications, which brings us to this whole idea about militarized carbon landscape or something that is called the carbon internet. And here again, you have this picture of uh, the, the coal field that I previously talked, told you about, which is not far from uh, this uh, Bagjan and this Visakupiti garden. And this is the larger uh, Lidu coal field where you can see there is rampant kind of, you know, uh, cutting down of uh, mountains and there is coal being very uh, recklessly dumped on the roadside. And on the right, again, you see this uh, proposed uh, mining field. Uh, this is Dihing Patkai rainforest at the back. And the mountain range, in fact, if you see, is Unachal and extending all the way to Nampong and uh, beyond Nampong is Myanmar, that is Pansau Pass. And some of you must be uh, familiar with the name because that is where the historic Stillwell Road is passing by, which connects Yunnan all the way to Lido in uh, Assam. This Lido on the left that is connected to Yunnan through that Stillwell Road. If we have more time to go into that, perhaps we will go into that. But uh, uh, this rainforest, in fact, is an elephant habitat now. And in fact, uh, for, uh, for some of us here in this part of the country, uh, it is very common that, you know, elephant movements are very common. In fact, in this area, which is also near to Digboy, which is the first refining, oil refinery of Asia, uh, it's very common that uh, uh, elephant movements stops traffic twice a day once in the morning when they come and once in the evening when they again retreat. So people have figured out a way to, in a way, cohabitate with the elephants. So there is some kind of ecological dynamics that is going on uh, of coexistence and cohabitation. Uh, but there are these proposals of coal excavation, open cast coal excavation, which came up last year during the lockdown, and it raised a lot of alarm bells ringing. So at the moment, there is a dispute and the court is looking into that. But what we have to understand is that the complexity of extraction, that is why one is talking about this concept of vernacular ideas of power, status and obligation, because, you know, uh, the lines are very blurry. The organizations who must be might be protesting this issue one day, you might see that they are in a way implicated in the extraction itself the next day. So we'll have to understand that, you know, this militarization, the presence of a strong extractive state and a certain class of people who are collaborators in the extraction, they in a way influence this whole, in a way, uh, resource politics that unfolds in these places. And that is something that one has to, you know, uh, look into more and more. So therefore, um, Sanjay Barbara talks about these three kind of disruptive capacity of capital, calamity, and counterinsurgency. Uh, because from the militarized hinterland or militarized landscape that we saw, which is also true is that there's a lot of wealth generation, a sudden kind of wealth that is being generated. There are inroads uh, made with larger economies outside. And there is a constant kind of a you know, a flow of capital. So one thing is for sure that more and more capital is flowing into Northeast. But what is the capacity of this capital? Therefore, the calamities, be it natural calamities like flood or the industrial disaster like the blowout, and relating to the militarization or we talk about the issue of security, things like insurgency and counterinsurgency. So they have a complex equation with this flow of capital. So we have to understand the sudden growth of the region 
through this. And then I will try to show you another interesting photo. Uh, two photos from two places, but there is again, I feel an interesting connection here. Um, and here I can refer to an interesting work by Mahesh Rangarajan and Gunan Shadarov again, uh, that is at nature's age, the global present and long-term history. Uh, where they talk about, you know, uh, when we talk about the age of Anthropocene, we have to talk about also not only how, but when and where. So that when and where is very important. And it's about uh, call for a more and not less rigorous history of the particular. So if you see now, uh, this again connects us back to the previous slide also, the issue of wealth or prosperity, quote unquote prosperity, that a wave of prosperity that seems to be there on the surface. When you talk about a rising Northeast or Northeast as a bridge ahead of Southeast Asia, as a gateway to Southeast Asia, this catch phrases when you hear, there is a aura of prosperity that seems to be there, but we have to connect it with different events happening. And on the left, we see this uh, uh, kind of, you know, timbering, in a wide scale happening. And this is from Kohima uh, to Dimapur Highway, which is actually called Asia Highway Number One. It's supposed to be a transnational highway at some point. And you see there are a lot of these uh, forests are being cleared for it, this huge uh, ancient old trees being cut to make room for the expansion of highway. And you see on the right, right this is from my hometown again from the Google. And you see uh, this, uh, rickshaw, which resembles this, uh, in a way, symbol of prosperity once, which is this elephant tugging at a limber, elephant transporting this timber, uh, which, which in a way became an emblem of prosperity once. In Orunachal and Aparasam, many towns who were based on plywood industry uh, uh, that was built under colonialism and continued well into the post-colonial times had created a lot of you know, sudden wealth for some section. And you see that uh, uh, there is a strong upper middle class, you can say, which nowadays sociologists are calling neo middle class in some sense. And there are this uh, expensive imported luxury cars are dotting the streets of the river, which was not the case till um, some years back. So in one photo, again, a, a significant kind of in a way contrast of the old world and the new world. But there is a very interesting connection between the two worlds, how one is feeding into the other. Uh, so, this takes us to the issue of infrastructure now. Because if there is one key word to understand the unfolding of Northeast, it is infrastructure. Because, you know, in fact, we can, in fact, call, I would like to call Northeast as an infrastructural region right now. Because if anyone comes to the region now and have been visiting since last maybe a couple of years, a decade, one would see that there is a never ending, relentless, you know, phase of construction, construction of new bridges, new highways, and new complexes. So there is never ending kind of, uh, kind of penetration into the region. But infrastructure has been, again, there are flags being raised, red flags being raised. Uh, there are issue of the in, in organic nature that it is perhaps, uh, in a way, has come from above. Uh, the benefits are not apparently uh, not immediately apparent, although I will come to it. There are you know, claims and there are uh, comments that there is benefit of that. And but what we have to primarily focus on that it is a discourse, which is a practice as well as a, as a uh, it is not only tangible material uh, practices, but it is institutions and networks that is around infrastructure. And in fact, uh, on, on a lighter vein, if you ask me, uh, what is the most sought after uh, uh, job of a person in Northeast right now? It is actually that of a contractor because, you know, that's where people are moving into. And uh, in this issue of contractor, I will again uh, come back because this is an important point, in fact, although I say it's a lighter wing, but important point. So, uh, Duncan, in fact, I uh, will come to that. I mean, there is this whole idea about contentious concrete. It is an exceptional region which is molded in the language of physicality and infrastructure. I think I shared uh, briefly the issue of Vision 2020 document. And if you see Vision 2020 document, it talks a lot about uh, physicality and infrastructure. It is all about closing a gap. It is all about bridging some kind of distance. It is all about making connectivity. And uh, so from there, from the position of policy making, um, uh, this whole geography of difference, that is complex geography of difference, 
is being sought to be filled up. There is an infrastructural void that is being observed, and that void is seen. That void needs to be filled. And uh, as uh, uh, Middleton uh, Townsend Middleton says, uh, the Chicken Neck Corridor remains to be seen as a congested kind of techno-formal domain where security and modern logistics visualizes the region. So physicality and infrastructure remains the key words through which the region has been approached primarily through different uh, policy doctrines and the remoteness of the regions continues to be seen as a problem. But as we will see, one is to also bring in some kind of element of history. We need to historicize this understanding of space and distance. As Duncan McDuya Ras says, uh, interestingly, he brings the concept of concrete and he says, what stories does it open up? Uh, what questions concrete poses about politics, power, development, and culture? So interestingly, as I told you, the region is going through an unending phase of construction and concretization. What does it tell us about uh, the life world of the region? How are life world of the region being affected? So that's uh, what we are trying to understand today. And therefore, the idea of roads become very useful. Uh, so as I said, uh, I mean, uh, I keep traveling whenever there is a chance. I uh, the Brugger is located in a central way, so it's not. I keep going into different parts of uh, northeast. Uh, what I have come across often is that uh, road making is actually a very, very you know. Uh, interesting kind of an insight into unlocking of minds as well as unlocking of policy positions. And one has to understand it through different ways as cultural meaning making as well as from the colonial vantage position of civilizing mission also. Uh, as Lipok Jubishu, talk, Lipok Mar Jubishu talk about uh, this tyranny of distance and tyranny of proximity. That how this idea of distance was seen to be breached by the idea of proximity uh, and and uh, and he gives goes back to the whole colonial discourse about how even for the British it was important to break this whole concept of isolation and roads were seen as the pathways through which societies and groups will come back to the fold of quote unquote civilization. And in fact, now we can say that civilization has been in a way, if not completely replaced, but in a way, supplemented by the idea of security. Whereas there is another aspect to road that is the cultural meaning making. And here I want to give a quick reference to the uh, one of the Sahitya Academy award winning novel by uh, Ornachal's, one of uh, Ornachal's uh, writer, one of the you know, uh, uh, veteran writer of Ornachal, Yeshe Dorji Thongshi, who is a Shaldu pen from the Tawang region. Uh, he, in his novel, talks about how, in fact, uh, if it translates to English, the meaning of the novel means something like, you know, uh, silent lips, murmuring hearts. So it's a story about two tribes of Arunachal uh, who had no common language, who had no linkages at all, historically separated. First time comes across each other through being inducted into road making endeavors, road making projects in the post-colonial India. They are employed in the road making, and it's actually a love story about this person from a girl from one tribe falling in love with a boy from another tribe, and they had no means of communication. That's why the name Silent Lips Marmoring Hearts. It's a very telling take on how roads and this infrastructure also has this way of opening up, you know, people's realities, and it has many different kind of consequences. Now, this picture I came across very, very recently, and I could not help but you know, share with you all. Uh, in fact, this is uh, a very recent picture. It was a trans Arunachal uh, motor uh, expedition that was organized by Arunachal government, and many people took part in this uh, expedition. And for, they wanted for the first time to cover the whole of Arunachal from uh, uh, this uh, Vijayanagar in uh, kind of, you know, Anjao district of Arunachal to the extreme uh, other part, this is uh, Tawang, uh, this uh, in Arunachal. So uh, this photograph, in fact, in a way, it's very interesting because you see this proud display of this person who is 
if I'm right, is from uh, Galo tribe. Uh, it's proud display of the art traditional, you know, kind of artifacts and uh, traditional years. And at the back, you see which is the present, you uh, know, illustrative picture of Northeast India, which is the ever present uh, kind of, you know, figure of a JCB or some kind of pickup truck. You can see river beds being dug up, and you can see the truck is actually carrying rocks from the river. And this is Dibong River. And some of you might remember this name because uh, this was a river where last year, into not last year, last to last year, there was this whole kind of tension and speculation that China is releasing uh, some kind of chemicals and some kind of you know uh, special substance because the black water was coming for long. And there was a whole speculation of water war, and this river again originates from China, Tibet. So uh, this is the Dibong River, and you can see excavation and all the work going on. And you see this proud display of tribal identity and this whole idea about transnational kind of motorcade passing by people posing and this development at the background. So again, I find this this I find sometimes these pictures tells us a lot of stories and a lot of things unfolding in the region right now. But through the unfolding, contradictions continue to unfold. You see the images of Guwahati, which is called the gateway to Southeast Asia now. It is a rising city in terms of you know, numbers of household, density of population, the urban, urbanization rate. The, it's, it's at par with many Indian cities now. At the same time, we have the reality of the peripheries within periphery. So basically, the infrastructure discourse has to factor in both the spatial as well as cultural dynamics of the region. And in fact, the second picture is from Karbiang Long Amtrang, where I visited. In fact, what was there outside their frame, which I cannot show you now, is in fact a camp, a small camp of a ceasefire insurgent group, which is under ceasefire. And uh, this picture was is from a few years before. And that time, there were these really young, teenage-looking boys with automatic weapons who were sitting there with some you know, transistor radio and playing for songs on the mobile phone. And what I found interesting is that many of these young kids actually had never traveled to Guwahati. Guwahati was very far from them. And they were asking me questions about Guwahati, about you know, how is it, or different questions about Guwahati. Interestingly, many of them had gone all the way to Kachin in Myanmar, across the border to Bhutan for their insurgency uh, camps for the military training. So uh, uh, this contrast of their realities and how infrastructure is actually impacting in these realities, that remains very interesting. Again, uh, these two markets, uh, basically, as and I hear I quote from uh, Rocky Zilpao, who has this interesting book called Infrastructure of Injustice, uh, recent 2019 public, 18 publication. And he talks about how basically sometimes the local governance system or traditional institutions, they remain outside the radar of infrastructure planning. So uh, the whole infrastructure planning design has been sometimes conceived from status perspective and which widens the gap between state and society. So uh, this first one is in Kidima in Nagaland. You can see uh, women uh, walking from remote places, uh, mount kilometers and kilometers from mountains coming down with their uh, sales to these markets. And other one is a traditional barter festival in uh, Morigao in Junbil, place called Junbil Ilassan. So this concept of traditional markets sometimes or the concept of traditional institution escapes the gaze of, you know, large scale, you can say, or macro infrastructure. Which again reflects this in a kind of situation of these two bridge uh, that I'm showing. And, and in fact, uh, now I don't have the time or the space to go into this whole concept of bridge making or bridge politics, quote unquote, which is becoming a very interesting topic in Northeast India now. And one keeps seeing a lot of documentaries, a lot of write ups being made on that, how Northeast is connected with some of the biggest bridges in India. Where again, again, I would like to go back to the earlier kind of, you know, uh, position where you can see that sometimes um, bridges also have different value or different connotation different weightage in the scheme of things. And sometimes, you know, that security or geopolitics, geopolitical corridor, they also have a large impact rather than, you know, bridges that mean uh, something for people in their daily life, day-to-day -day life. Bridges is a part of people's lived reality.
from the from that idea of uh, inorganic infrastructure or infrastructure which is basically led by state initiatives uh, we also have to come to the another very crucial concept of nationalization of space or meaning making of space and here this is very interesting uh, stone relic uh, of mechuka or mechuka and this is not far from the very first slide that we show that we showed of mr tago sitting near the waterfall if you remember the place that we discussed that time which is a place of contestation uh, a very fragile uh, place on the international border of mechuka which has come out now in fact in tourism radar a lot uh, you see this the very interesting stone relics who are considered sacred for them and in fact this relic this stone is supposed to resemble the very geographical characteristic you can say or the shape of the valley of mechuka valley these are supposed to be the shape of the mountain and these are this is the valley cut into two by the uh, rock formation mountain formation and locals believe that this is the exact copy of their uh, uh, landscape Menchuka, which is in Tibetan belief one of the nine Shangri-Las of the world, our lost horizons of the world, and it translates into from Tibetan it translates into land of medicinal snow water. So they say that this is actually uh, sacred and it is time immemorial. It is there always. It shows them their the landscape, the aerial view of the landscape. Uh, now what happened is that now Menchuka has become one of the major. military outpost of india the last military outpost near mekmohan line and the military presence of military is vital even to the economy of the place to the ecosystem of the place so therefore now the locals have started viewing this own tradition and relic through the eyes of the military now military uh, helicopters or the pilots they do some aerial survey and they tell them whether it is right or wrong and locals seem to largely go with that so there is this kind of securitization of nationalization that is happening at the same time there is another photo which i'm not showing here and that had almost led to certain kind of a you can say tension or dispute between the locals vis-a-vis the security establishment that is a waterfall which is considered by the local tibetan uh, local buddhist Uh, the, the not tibetan members 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 are the tribe that is from menchuka by the way and members are based both in tibet region of china and in india in fact more in the tibet region of china in numbers uh, than in menchuka you know, shiomi district of india uh, in their belief uh, they say guru rinpoche which is one of the highest uh, gurus of buddhism they came into one cave and he meditated there and it is considered a sacred spot now now there is also the belief that guru nanak also came there from uh, on the way from tibet and one of the regiment of uh, military regiment one regiment has actually made initially proposed to make some gurudwara in that spot saying that guru nanak came there only there was some resentment from the local population now the gurudwara has shifted from that spot to another nearby spot but the gurudwara has already become uh, another of the one the tourist kind of attraction of the tourist circuit so uh, the, these are the areas where sometime you know you can see the certain securitization or nationalization of space now to understand why is this nationalization now this is a very complex topic and now this is not the focus of my presentation today but still i would try to quickly uh, just to understand just trying to figure out the geo geopolitical importance of this place why there is such a attempt to securitize or nationalize these spaces is that uh, that is the elephant in the room that no one talks about that is the place of china or the position of china and which uh, certain you know uh, geo strategist uh, uh, called as the great game east is uh, barton lintner has this uh, discourse uh, basically uh, china's attempt to connect this belt rail uh, belt road initiative with somehow with the approach that india was initially uh, promoting that is active policy that china time to time indicates that they want the two to align and india has a lot of apprehension about it china wants to connect that you know their initiative about you know bhutan bangladesh uh, and uh, myanmar with larger you know initiatives in the bay of bengal area so there are indications that china wants to use the steel rail road 
to do some trade with especially with Aparasam. In fact, a small diplomatic crisis happened once where this truckload of Chinese goods actually entered from Arunachal Nampung border that is Stilwell Road and attended a trade fair all the way in Guwahati. And that created a mini diplomatic crisis or it actually China's, it was China's way to show the feasibility of Stilwell Road. And India was not very easy with that kind of a message. So that factor we have to, now we don't have time to discuss this in detail, but one has to understand that that presence of China and this Chinese grand initiatives like Belt Road Initiative or One Belt One Road Initiative uh, is always a factor. And Actis policy therefore also is making Japan more and more part of it. So there is this whole specific rim initiative that Japan is initiating. So Pacific Rim and PRI, they too are somehow potentially colliding over Northeast India. And that will have some very severe implication for our region. So that is what one will have to keep in mind. Now to sum up some of the previous discussion before we move on to the point on exuberation or expectation. We see that environmental impact assessment 2020 that came as a proposal and since the controversy that happened, it has been for the time being again put under a kind of consideration. You see that that whole triadic state that we talk about so far, that extractive state that talks about cultural obscurity and talks about geopolitics, that comes completely uh, alive in the case of EIA 2020 proposal, the draft EIA proposal, that, e that amendment that was supposed to be brought. Now, these four photographs on the screen that you see are for, again, four different diverse uh, places. What's common in the four photos that all the four places will be exempted for any kind of environmental clearance, industrial uh, clearance. First one you see here is orange orchards in Wakro Valley in Lohit district. Second one, again, Menchuka in Xiomi district. Uh, that is Yargapchu River, which is uh, Yarlong Chang Post uh, before it become you know, Siam or Siang, and finally joins another river to become Brahmaputra. So very, very interesting, very, very significant river. And you see here, you see on, uh, uh, this is uh, above Anini, near Anini, or Nachal, this is rhododendron flowers blooming. And here again, Namsai district, rainforest and people living by the river. Another very interesting uh, state, district bordering uh, near Myanmar. Uh, culturally also people sharing a lot of cultural affinity to groups in you know Myanmar Khamti people. So these four photographs are very interesting but again because the regulation that if any place is uh, within 100 kilometer of aerial distance from international border they will be exempted from environmental clearance. Uh, this will be called strategic exemption. Then there is whole idea of post facto clearance, reduced notice period of public hearing, Already there are a lot of documentation as to how in Northeast India public hearing have been manipulated with. Uh, they are bypassed in effect many places. Even if they are in place, it is made almost untenable for the larger groups. And of course, violation of Panchayat Act and Forest Dwellers Rights Act 2006. So these are again broad points, but in sum, what we're trying to say is that uh, these are instances that actually made many people ask or reflect on the triadic nature of the state about extraction, uh, cultural kind of, you know, intervention and geopolitics. Now moving on, now we can skip this. So uh, therefore, what we are trying to say is that the whole area becomes a resource frontier or empty underpopulated wilderness that holds the promise of high rate of investment. And this point perhaps will come back if we have time. I want to go because we, our time is not, time is not much. So I'm trying to say the neoliberal context of growth, which is in other parts of India also, that is precarious forms of employment, it gets added to the lens of security. We again, you see these armed soldiers dotting the high roads, at the same time new prosperous looking highways coming. So security and jobless growth, they are both happening side by side. So therefore, what we have to understand is that, that uh, the common question, many people would ask the question that, you know, and it's the right question that Northeast seems to be also having a lot of new industries. There is some kind of, you know, we can say um, unfolding of new initiatives in the Northeast. Uh, cities are growing. So what it means on ground. So what we can say is that, uh, and which is what uh, I, we can take insight from 
developmental anthropologist like Keith Barney who talks, looks into Laos and other countries. And in fact, Anna Ching also who talks and uh, looks a lot in South, Southeast Asia, especially Malaysia and Indonesia. And you see that uh, there are a lot of parallels you can draw in the case of Northeast that frontier spaces, if they remain as frontier spaces, that can be peripheralized even while being integrated into the globalized economy. And here again, I remember uh, here uh, uh, an economist um, uh, Alokesh Borua, uh, who made an interesting point that uh, activist policy perhaps is not the first time that Northeast economy is going to be globally integrated or has become globally integrated. He points out the whole colonial experience that Northeast was already integrated into world economy through world economy of tea, world economy of oil. So this idea of peripheralization and integration of globalized economy can still happen at the same time. So there are this new kind of concept of fossil fuel identity. Some people are calling it Dolikikon in her interesting work that we cited before, calls it carbon citizenship. There is in other places, other scholars are calling hydraulic citizenship concept, hydraulic citizenship. In other words, the presence of these resources and how one's inability to meaningfully engage with the resources or the way one in fact is in a way understanding one's inroads into the resources also influences one's sense of self-identity. So that is a very interesting kind of a takeaway point that is Northeast is giving us right now, that Northeast is showing us that, you know, that our identities also are very much tied down to the nature of resource extraction or to the nature of resource engagements. How do you engage with our resources? Uh, right here, I would like to again dwell on this a bit uh, because, you know, one has to understand when we talk about Northeast, as I said, it is extremely diverse. There are too many cultural life worlds. There are groups which are numbering just few thousand to big groups who are numbering millions. Uh, what we have to understand is that there are very interesting indigenous groups uh, and the practices that they have. Uh, there are attachments. There is this kind of this organic kind of cosmology where there are attachments of groups with every single piece of rock in their place. For example, if you talk about Angami Nagas, in their villages, you have every piece of rock sometime would have a name and the rocks will not be just a, will not just have a life identity, but they will be part of their folklore or mythology also. And if you see some other villages here, again, I remember the Ahoms and versus Aonaga battles. And if you see their Aonagas also in their historical memory, they have stories of their waterfalls, their rocks, uh, taking shape and helping the people against the invading army. So basically their natural landscape is part of their, not only of their historical memory, but of their lived reality. But what we are seeing now, as I talked about the issue of being contractor, within these communities also, we have now more and more people who will identify with that of the role of a contractor, someone who is, you know, taking part in some kind of, you know, rampant extraction, road making expansion of the landscape. So what happens to those historical memories? What is the disjuncture that happens? What is the disruption that happens? And what does the disruption do to the people as such? How does it tear apart the social fabric or does a new type of identity get born? So these are the questions that now in the Northeast we are really asking ourselves. But at the same time, now we have to also understand this place as a land made up of expectations also. Uh, having said, uh, talked about extraction, the expectations are also important because you know life is all about expectation and life moves on. So uh, here again we see there are these uh, concepts like feast of merit, which are poor indigenous practices. At some point, indigeneity was defined by these poor practices, and we have to see that what happens to this type of practices, which is all about harmony, which is all about the spirit of giving which is all about the spirit of coexistence uh, with nature and uh, nation. So we have to understand all this. And we have to see that uh, Northeast is actually a land of now contradictions and complexities. One photo, you see that Santa Claus is adorning traditional Naga headgears. In the other, you see that in Sikkim, you see that the cellular towers are almost becoming part of the architecture of the uh, Gompa um, or within the Chauten, the prayer, prayer means. So this very complex kind of coexistence needs to be understood more and more. Then um, talking about expectations, we see that how uh, people in a way have found a way that 
they are in a way even then the presence of armed forces the militarization and the celebration of life kind of continues uh, the first picture is from manipur university i wanted to show this picture because perhaps it will not be thinkable in many parts of india that there is uh, armed vehicles with uh, machine guns patrolling within university campuses and they are parked outside the departments when there is classes happening inside and the second photo is in mizoram university some one festival that was going on rock concert that was going on but what i'm trying to say that there is a complex coexistence between the two between the concert and the bullet there is a coexistence and that defines life in northeast india so what remains very crucial is to understand how locals understand transformation so that is most crucial and uh, this picture that we see in left is from my hometown in dibrugarh Uh, the Brahmaputra River and the Mount Arunachal Himalayas, as you can see on the other side. Now, why I do this picture is that this actually this area of uh, these groups are very of mixed locality. Have uh, indigenous Assamis, then we have you know other people from other communities. There is different people from different religious backgrounds. So this becomes a common meeting point where people play uh, some sports in the evening. You hear languages which are very mixed here. So that shows this hybridity actually is a reflection of the place. that hybridity by the side of a hybrid landscape all at the same time it's almost like they are you know seamlessly merging because this river in dibrugarh have again gone through a lot of changes the site of lower subansiri dam which i did not discuss today is further down from this river uh, and which is another contentious uh, contentious area of dispute now anti dam movement and all going on and brahmaputra itself have changed its course so much at one point the colonial dibrugarh was much inside the town and it well into the river after the 1950 earthquake so it is a river which is a archive of some kind of a memory and on the right you see that uh, you have children this is majuli river island of india now a district the first okay, the first island district of india in fact uh, majuli island uh, these are children swimming across in fact they are going to the school so you see people are in a way coexisting through the hardship and agency people are really with a in a way undeniable spirit they are going about it so i want to basically end with this um, traditional missing folk song which i think reflects the philosophy of life you can say in some way and uh, it's there in the screen one can read that is let's oh dear let's build a house even if big or small near the bank of bornoi by our paddy fields that will protect us from the ray of the sun and the moon so uh, with this i would like to you know wrap up this uh, lecture here uh, expecting more questions comments because i am aware of the fact that i have you know uh, kind of uh, rushed through some of the slides because some of them merits much larger discussion and debates and perhaps uh, that can be taken up in the discussion thank you vitista thank you everyone thank you costa <laughs> it was such a insightful and in-depth and also emotional uh, account of uh, northeast india that we so rarely get to hear in this part of the world uh, we'll take a few questions um, the you know whoever has a question can raise a hand and i can call out your name and then can unmute yourself to ask the question or you can type in your question in the chat box i'll read it out Uh, Stu Stuti Goswami has a comment. Uh, she, uh, this is a this was an interesting deliberation. She says, "Okay, we'll wait for a few minutes for the questions to come in." Yeah, I guess I it was very broad also. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Uh, you know, the content was too lot yeah, actually. <laughs> Wants to also talk about some specific point. I mean, if there's um more discussion needed on some particular slide also because. Yeah. So I, I, if I can, uh, you know, start off the discussion. Yeah. Uh, Costa, would you like to, you know, reflect on, um, you know, this entire naughty situation and vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic? Is, uh, is there something unique about uh, the naughties, or you know? Yeah, thanks for asking. Actually, in fact, I was uh, meaning to also somehow align the discussion with the pandemic, but then we got too involved in the thing. Um, as in, yeah, I mean. this whole idea about this cosmology that you know of cosmology of coexistence uh, this idea of you know uh, some kind of you know one cohabiting with nature that that was emphasized a lot i think during the pandemic there was some kind of a realize realization 
and we saw a lot of uh, examples that ways of you know uh, people trying to come out with traditional knowledge practices uh, during the pandemic as you know in northeast a lot of uh, villages especially in the hills and the mountains and not only there in the valleys also we had certain kind of you know practices which was almost you can say uh, geared up geared for a pandemic kind of situation i mean uh, there are good practices which is already talking about uh, hygiene and in a way isolation uh, which was sometime related with also rituals and taboo but the underlying traditional science or traditional knowledge perhaps was about you know hygiene and distancing so people try to revive that also there is this whole idea about you know community participation a lot of interesting case studies or examples that came up how in many uh, hills especially in hill communities uh, people in a way through voluntary contribution as people coming together they made uh, this almost like parallel village set up outside the village boundary for people who would come back from cities so that uh, that we saw at one level another level of course since uh, northeast is also region of out migration which is not the which is not a topic of discussion in today's discussion but which is very important when it comes to northeast because it is also a region of out migration often we think of northeast as place where there are a lot of migration happening and politics and conflict about migration but of course northeast is also a migration producing region so there is now this kind of you know discussion or reflection happening uh, what about all the people who came back and uh, how will they may they find themselves in the ecosystem now what will be their position now and will they bring back some skill or they will create some kind of friction in the system now so those are some of the i can think of some of the discussion regarding pandemic happening here thank you kostu does anyone have any clarification to make any question okay there is a question by uh, professor tv srinivas Well, uh, you have tried to connect very uh, different socio-economic and cultural issues of northeast, which is a somewhat sensitive and contentious area. In science, we simply uh, simplify issues, but you are broadly mixing complex issues. New approach of for some of us. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the idea is basically. Uh, i mean about mixing up basically i was trying to still find some kind of connecting thread between them i mean and the connecting thread for me perhaps would be the nature of extraction nature of resource extraction and how that's why in the first slide itself i was trying to talk about this three kind of you know broad uh, vantage points through which northeast have been approached and continues to be approached so, and that is that idea of development deficit idea of cultural obscurity and this whole uh, overarching concept of security and how this three combined produce uh, the experience of northeast india so in that uh, i mean i was trying to that i tried to keep it as some connecting kind of thread and within that the idea of resource frontier how northeast can be seen as a resource frontier and needs to be seen as a resource frontier but having said so uh, it is true that uh, there are a lot of contentions within that so this is basically trying to figure out whether it can be a frame uh, because northeast has been seen through various frames and resource frontier of course has been one of the frame that has been explored of late by a few of the writers and in that i was trying to add in to some more of this observations from different spots and trying to bring into just basically trying to argue how geography and history both needs to be factored in sometime because developmental Uh, kind of approaches they talk about the geographical locations or sometimes it's talk about historic historicizing of certain kind of you know position but how there should be combination of two so that was my idea of connecting the good issues but thanks for comment actually i am thankful for the question because one of the uh, you know goals of parasper also is to you know uh, uh, you know facilitate a dialogue between methodologies you know there is a set of methodologies in science and there is a set of methodology in humanities and social sciences and we sometimes don't you know uh, there is a much much and we don't seem to understand so i think with this kind of lectures we get yeah. to know each others you know way of research and way of work yeah yeah thanks about the point of methodology actually i should maybe i should clarify 
I mean, this is also something that is, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows, but still just talk, speaking out aloud. Uh, this is something that is also multi-sided ethnography, where you basically, you know, bring ethnographic perspectives from multiple sites and try to still kind of, you know, find their binding theme. So I could say that this research is mostly motivated by a multi-sided ethnographic approach. Yeah, so Costa, there's another question. Uh, as Northeast has reached uh, traditional medicine practice, do they believe in modern medicine for COVID treatment? How effective are vaccination drive in this region? Yeah. About the vaccination drive, as in, uh, again, as you see, the population size is very different here. And uh, uh, and also the state responses are different. It will vary across states. Uh, so vaccination, that means uh, I'm not aware of the All India percentage as on date. But uh, again, here, some states started early and some st states started late. So Assam has uh, started vaccination a bit early and some states basically, you know, started uh, a bit late. Uh, but about traditional uh, medicine practice, it's interesting question because there is a lot of reliance on traditional practice, uh, medicine practice. But so far, uh, I have not come across any very significant push for any kind of the traditional medicine practice as such. That primarily perhaps what explains this is also because this traditional practice is also very much controlled by community organizations and community bodies out here because out here life is very communitarian, especially when it comes to the tribal states. Uh, so if the community organizations do not give a call for that, it's not very common that people will on their own will, uh, go. Although Arunachal, I do remember that there are the shamanic practices in certain part of Arunachal and the shamans were doing certain rituals for, you know, uh, against Corona and people found it very poignant because the shamans were also, in a way, isolated and they had to wear masks and they were doing this kind of practice of warding of the evil of COVID. So it is very interesting times when you see this kind of dichotomies. Uh, Meenakshi, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, Kostov, that was a very, very nice talk. And uh, it was, wasn't was just about binaries, also your photos were, every slide had a binary of photos. So I'm very happy. I mean, this is a very yeah. good selection of photos, which really Thank brought out the whole whole gamut of problems that we have in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And I was struggling to find one question that I wanted to ask because it's uh, just every mm -hmm. slide had 20 questions. Uh, but yeah. anyway, if, if we just uh, talk about, you know, uh, the question of agency here, you know, there's uh, this binary of state versus the people, right? Mm -hmm. you, many of your photos made, made clear that uh, nobody's being asked about what they want before things are being done. Yeah. So, so who's, who's, who's in charge here? What's happening? And why? And what, what, is the, what is the role of political parties? And you know, who's in government? And how are, how are all these things getting factored into what decisions are being made for whom and who? who, who what, what, why is it that you know, there's this huge disjunct because the people in government are also people who, in some sense, represent True. represent the local people, right? So True. why is this happening? Is it because, uh, you know, the the gov the states where there are a BJP rule governments, for example, they have to draw the line of the center? Or I mean, what what is it? Why is it that you know there's this huge disjunct between what is what the people want and what is actually happening? Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Minakshi, because, you know, there was one slide which I thought will take things in a different tangent altogether. I skipped the slide. Maybe I will just quickly again go to that because I did, this was one actually question that was also troubling me. And I also wanted to reflect on it more. So let me just uh, go to this slide. Okay. Yeah, so, you're a political scientist, so. Yeah, yes. 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 Yeah. Because I need your... Feel sense of the presentation. So I was trying to see how, I mean, one, of course, the frame this uh, Sanjeev Barua has been talking for long, this issue of contentious politics, uh, how basically that boundaries between what we consider as institution and what we consider outside institution, many a times, you know, interpenetrate. And so this, I think that becomes very useful for us to also look into it from that perspective that you know there is a lot of in kind of overlapping of this uh, different kind of uh, categories and you know there is issue of bargaining issue of you know participation limited participation and therefore the bhagjan example i mean i wish i could talk more about bhagjan because bhagjan is very crucial now to understand this issue that you know why 
kind of you know who has the agency and uh, what kind of choices that people make uh, because you know in bagjan right now we are seeing that uh, people sometimes are victims as well as perpetrators both uh, so uh, this uh, the whole idea about uh, that uh, oil well being uh, present in the village uh being seen as a problem from there now people have started demanding oil well within their village because they see that it is some kind of a lucrative kind of a prospect to have an oil well within your vicinity so you know that that i think needs to be kind of factored in to from the rubrics of militarization or the idea of kind of you know uh, what we call that fossil identity or carbon citizenship that you know people somehow have internalized and out here of course the whole idea about there are interesting uh, discourse coming up about the role of new middle class in the region so i think you have to bring it up also the whole idea about new middle class there is this uh, prosperous class which earlier we had this middle class which was somewhat antagonistic uh, with the state at least under certain circumstances but now we have perhaps another class which is in a way of a significantly collaborative nature and they have perhaps taken over the hegemonic control uh, about you know the sense of one sense of aspirations one sense of participations once even the one sense of social reality itself that people have started envisioning one's reality within that parameter there is some kind of you know uh, the the nature of bargaining have in a way also changed over the course of time but i i don't know whether i'm answering your question but uh, i think that idea of the class is also quite important there and the yeah thanks kostov i mean I, i think you i mean you know we are getting there we should have a separate discussion on this there are other questions i mean that this bagjan thing it, you know the fact that people now want a well is a post facto thing it's because uh, you know it's happened after the after the well thing happened and they see now there are lots of advantages of this but the point is who put the well there who was the one who decided that the well would, should be there in the first place right that yeah, is the question yeah, anyway i think yeah let's 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 go on to uh, other questions there's an ecolo- ecological question which is more in your line so yeah thanks very much yeah <clears throat> so this is the next question uh, the next question is by luna rajkwar she says good evening sir i want to ask you something that ray for, for cancer treatment is found in the soil of arunachal does this type of thing come into political ecology part i'm sorry in between i did not get about cancer treatment yes uh, i want to ask you something that ray for cancer treatment is found in soil of arunachal okay does this type of thing come into political ecology part i guess it would if if suppose uh, if that is part of certain communities because i'm not aware of this particular uh, issue as such to be honest but if it is a uh, suppose if it is a traditional knowledge practice of a certain community and it has been now it is being commercially kind of explored or it has taken some other dimension then of course it is very much part of political ecology uh, right here right i mean out here let me give another example of arunachal uh, in arunachal in many places now uh, this uh, ginseng has is being uh, this root called ginseng has been uh, commercially grown the ginseng plantation has been coming up and now many tribes are raising issues regarding that because uh, what they initially did not realize that it has some kind of harmful effect on the soil quality in the long term so uh, this type of issues so if this commercial uh, exploration of a particular knowledge traditional knowledge is done in a way contrary to the expectation or contrary to the you know norms of the community then of course it will be political ecology that is one and immediately arunachal always had this notion or the uh, kind of in a way uh, you can say the uh, background of uh, geopolitics again as i talked about the invisible elephant in the room so arunachal if anything is found right now the first thing will be issue of quote unquote nationalization that this knowledge or this resource should be with india so the idea will be that before china or other country can in a harness this india should do so this competition of nationalization that that is in fact in a way driving a lot of political ecology in arunachal so i think in these two ways it qualifies but again i not aware of this particular issue 
are there any more question okay if there is no other question then uh, uh, we thank costa for this very insightful you know account of northeast and we hope to have you again uh, thank, thank you so much costa and thank you everyone for attending yes, thank you thank you everyone thank you. see you bye see you see you bye bye